Anyone? <laughs> Always. Never shy. Love you. So today, Introduce yourself uh, and a little bit about your first days uh, for the blind. Hello, everyone and extra guests. My name is Maiko Eugene, and in three weeks, I will be graduating with my Master's of Public Health. Yay! Um, and today, we met with people at CSIS, and we were tasked with reading two articles about some of the research that they do in their um, think tank, and we were able to engage in a roundtable discussion about that. We also met with um, the Department of Human human services, health and human services as well, and they talked to us about different opportunities for us to intern or job opportunities and other pathway programs specific to different sectors of health and human services. And just about 30 minutes ago, um, maybe less, we just had a presentation on human trafficking and some of the information that that all entailed. Very good. Thanks for the recap. All right. And who can remember who's on top of the schedule tomorrow and can give an update on where you all are headed first thing in the morning. <laughs> We're headed to Congress. Woo! Woo! All right. What are you going to do in Congress? Uh, stay like any other day. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so representing FIU, obviously. Um, so we're going to be talking, or we're going to be meeting with various members, some from Florida, some from other states, and continuing the conversations on health equity and how we can bring that back home. Wonderful. And, and we know that this group is ready for that. Um, before I introduce our co-host for the evening, uh, I'm excited about uh, what we're about to experience uh, because as the fly-in students are uh, experiencing, um, as our Hamilton scholars, which you'll soon meet, as any intern that's part of our uh, amazing uh, programming that our fearless leader, Eric Feldman, in the back uh, helps put on. Uh, FIU is not shy um, or does not hold back in unleashing our talent, which you all represent and our Hamilton scholars represent, uh, to the world. Yes, we're here officially as the university to advocate for our research portfolio, but we're also here to support our students, and we'd like to bring them back into that first lane and get them advocating for our research portfolio, and we're here to convene national dialogues, and we get our students involved in those national dialogues as this group will be part of our uh, program on Thursday on global health. Um, so all of those collide for us, and we're also going to get a taste of that today. Um, this is the fourth semester of the Hamilton S Scholars Program, or am I off by one? Fourth in person, maybe. OK. Uh, one virtual, uh, so five. Multiple... He keeps me honest. Yeah. So with each semester, we keep on building upon, building upon. And we have some of our former Hamilton scholars. Carlos Padilla, thank you for making it out to support the cause. Any other formers? Or actually, not formers, because once you're a Hamilton scholar, you're always a Hamilton scholar. Yeah. There you go. Uh, but this semester and some of the presentations you'll uh, experience tonight, uh, these are our scholars, for those that are joining us, that have spent the semester, in addition to uh, being part of an amazing uh, academic cohort, learning. Uh, uh, cutting edge research that FIU faculty are engaged with. Those are their clients, so you'll get a taste of who their clients are. Uh, actually being in, in, in action, scheduling meetings on the Hill or at the agency side, helping prepare briefing documents, et cetera. So we're excited. And those topics this semester range from environmental resilience, environmental justice, uh, security across the Americas, forensics, human trafficking, sustainability, so runs the gamut. Uh, so we're excited to hear what their policy proposals and their uh, activity this semester has been. Uh, reminder to the group of our fly-in students, this too can be you. This ho We hope this will be you. Uh, we're now recruiting for our next cycle for the fall, uh, and we're looking forward to, to a lot of interest from that group. But now it's my honor uh, to introduce a very special uh, person, uh, because uh, without her, I think the the quality of the presentations, the uh, information we're able to wrap around in this academic uh, course every Tuesday tonight uh, wouldn't be the same. Uh, also represents what is an amazing uh, uh, example of FIU uh, talent that uh, was active on the Hill, uh, came here on a wish and a prayer for an internship, ended up at the end of her congressional career being chief of staff 
now is uh, helping lead, in addition to a lot of her extracurricular activities, is active in uh, campaign world, but is also uh, helping lead a very important association, National Association of Broadcasters. So Charlene Stanberry, it's an honor to introduce you, and you're also going to introduce some of our guests this evening. So Carlos, don't, so just want to say thank you, everybody. So Carlos don't know this. I'm actually going to pass the mic to our special guests. Um, and so if they can actually just say their name, um, you know, what type of work they do, and what brings you here to FIU today. Hi, everyone. My name is Osiris Morrell. I am a federal and state lobbyist and sometimes local lobbyist at Brownstein High at Barbara Schreck. Um, I'm here today at FIU to engage with many of you, but also Carlos and well, Char too as well um, asked me to be here just to get to learn a little bit more about the programs that you guys are engaging in. FIU, um, a lot of the state lobbying I do is in Florida, and a lot of the issues that you guys are interested in I have been lobbying on, and they directly impact some of the clients that I work for. So very excited to be here, and thank you all for having me. Well, good evening. My name's Earl Ash. I am Deputy Director for Mayor Eric Adams. I handle his federal legislative affairs work in D.C. Um, I'm happy to be here, happy to see some presentations. I handle his health portfolio, which is huge in New York. He's big into public safety. I'm sure there's a lot of intersections of what you guys are going to present and what I'm going to learn from you. I'm excited to see that, and um, let's get it done. Um, and I'm here, and I pretty much do what Charlotte Stanberry tells me to do because I kind of I took her job. So <laughs> she's a mentor of mine, and you know um, I'm a big advocate of uh, lifting as you climb. She does that, so I'm gonna do that, and I'm here to support you all. So thank you uh, for having a presentation today. Um, hi, my name is Nicole. Um, I recently graduated in December from FIU, and I moved out here for a job opportunity, and I'm super excited to be here, and I can't wait to hear the presentations. And last but not least, you get to reintroduce yourself. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Diego Luque, uh, FIU graduate, class of 2015. I am now with the Department of Homeland Security here in D.C. under the Blue Campaign. Uh, we are a national human trafficking awareness campaign. Uh, so just thank you so much for having me today. Looking forward to these presentations. Okay. So could you do a little setup of the background once again? Yeah, so just so that everyone knows, so for the Hamilton scholars that we have, they're amazing, first off. Um, so be sure to, you know, think about the program um, and talk to your friends about it. If you're interested, feel free to ask us questions. But as they are here in Washington, D.C. doing their internships, this is a class that we've had every Tuesday night. So they, we basically come in here and we talk about different facets of D.C., whether it is the legislative process, whether it's the judicial branch. We spoke about appropriations, which you're going to see a lot of numbers on some of these presentations. Um, you know, we talk about... Um, lobbying and what lobbying is, campaign finance, everything under the sun to make you successful here in D.C. Washington, D.C. to be working here, what are some advice you have, and also it's just to give a worldwide exposure to what D.C. has to offer, because a lot of people may not think about this, but when I worked on the Hill, everyone was asking me about FIU, and everyone was asking me about Miami and South Florida, so there is a huge interest no matter what interest area you're involved in, and so it looks like Andreas is going to be our first presentation, 
So as you're looking at these presentations um, and listening to them, think about some key components about who their client is, um, what portion of the DC process that they're talking about, and then also what solutions they may be offering in their policy presentations. So I'm gonna kick it off to Andreas, who's gonna introduce himself um, and also talk about his internship and then flow into his project. Hi everyone, hope you're having a great day so far. As she said, my name's Andres Velasco and I've had the wonderful pleasure of interning here in DC for a couple months now. My current internship is with Representative Mario diaz Villart from South Florida, as many of you may know. I have loved my internship up here in the Hill. It's my second internship and I just keep loving the Hill more and more every day. Don't let people try and bring you down. The Hill is very hectic, but it's a wonderful experience where you get to truly help people every single day. Every single time you pick up that phone, it could be a family member, it could be a friend of a friend, it could be their mom. It's an amazing experience. And if any of you are interested in any Hill internships or anything of that nature, feel free to talk to me after my presentation or after everyone's presentation. And I'll feel free to tell you my experience so far. But to get started, my Hamilton project was helping FIU lobby and upgrade our Wallowin facility, or WOW, as many of us may know it. WOW is a very important facility that is critical for hurricane research and has allowed FIU to be worlds ahead for this type of research. It allows us to research different things such as what building materials are best, best suited for certain amounts of hurricane in our current project is to make sure that the wall of wind is upgraded to category six levels, which is hurricane winds upwards of 180 miles per hour. As we all know, hurricanes are a large topic that a lot of us in South Florida deal with. Not only South Florida, but a lot of coastal regions, both in the Gulf of Mexico and along the Atlantic seaboard, which brings us to my project. But before I go more in depth in my project, a little bit about me. I am a current senior at Florida International University. I majored in history and minored in both economics and marketing. As I said before, I've interned twice for the House of Reps, both times for South Florida members where I've been able to directly impact my community and had an amazing time. I additionally interned for USAID in the summer of 2022, where I was able to help them in the wake of the Russian invasion to Ukraine, help them with civilian military disaster relief. Additionally, I've interned with Accenture's North American Government Relations Group, where I've been able to learn the outside scope of lobbying and advocacy efforts. And I am graduating next month, thankfully, and I will be seeking full-time employment on government affairs, or whether that may be private sector or public sector, but very excited to start working. So that brings me to my client for my project. My clients were both the Extreme Events Institute, or EEI, as well as NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. But specifically in EEI, it was with experts such as Richard S. Nolson, who is the director of the EEI. It is a preeminent program at FIU that prouds itself to prepare us for hurricane and other disaster relief. So that brings me to my project ask. We are asking for $5 million for fiscal year 2024. $4.05 million would go to high testing sensors, high testing projects to allow us to build different, size, different sorts of infrastructure projects to see what building materials are able to withstand, what amount of winds, what protocol should be in place, what regulation should be in place. The rest would be 850,000 for various testing sensors, including but not limited to multi-channel data acquisition systems, high wind velocity probes, high capacity 3D loading cells, and precipitation imaging probes. Some key players for the project include congressional committees, federal agencies, as you can see some logos, and key congressional members. Some key committees that were involved in our project include both House and Senate um, committees on Appropriation, House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works, and lastly, the Congressional Committee on Homeland Security. Federal agencies that were key players in our project include NOAA, which stands for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Associ uh, Administration, 
FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the Department of Energy, and lastly, the National Science Foundation. Some key congressional members include Debbie Washerman Schultz, Carlos Jimenez, Maria Villar Salazar, and Mario Diaz Bilar. To summarize my project, hurricane damage has become a growing concern in the United States, with NOAA estimating an average of six major hurricanes per year. The increasing frequency and severity of these hurricanes, particularly in coastal regions, have highlighted the critical importance of ensuring that our buildings and infrastructure can withstand these extreme weather events. Data shows that over the past few decades, the number of Atlantic hurricanes reaching category four or five has nearly doubled. And unfortunately, that is not slowing down anytime soon. With the potential for even stronger storms in the future, it is vital that we have the necessary resources and infrastructure to research, test, and improve our preparedness for such events. The consequences of these events can be devastating, leading to loss of life, displacement of communities, and billions of dollars in economic damage. As you see in my figure, in the past decade, damages have nearly doubled from 2001 to 2010. It was 1.678 trillion. From 2011 to 2020 it is 2.483 trillion. On average, hurricane damages estimated up to $53 billion from the period of 1980 to 2020. Unfortunately, in the last five years, that number has surged to $153 billion every single year. That's where FIU and our research comes in. We want to make sure that our communities are better prepared and more resilient for these sorts of extreme weather events. By being prepared for these events, we will bring that cost of $153 billion way down. We're wanting to make sure that there is no displacement of communities, no loss of life, and to ensure that everyone from Caribbean countries to Gulf of, Mex Gulf of Mexico states to all the states along the eastern seaboard were prepared and ready for whatever comes our way. So I would just like to thank you for sitting in my presentation. And I would like to urge you that if you feel inspired or compelled to, please reach out to your congressional members and let them know that you support hurricane testing research and facilities. And especially let them know that FIU, again, is worlds ahead with this research and we don't plan on stopping anytime soon. So thank you once again. My name is Andres Velasco and please feel free to talk to me if you're wanting to intern in DC. I would love to share my experience as it has been positive. Thank you. Can get this mic. Okay, so wonderful presentation. So what we're going to do is we're going to have one special guest, you know, ask a question, give a comment, their initial reaction, and then also get one of our students from the fly-in. So do we have a special guest that wanted? I see Christopher Cox. Mr. Chief. Thank you, thank you. First, wonderful presentation. I'm so excited to see that you focus your presentation around this because I'm from a coastal city, Moss Point, Mississippi, in the Gulf Coast, and we all know, and I'm a, a Hurricane Katrina survivor, right? So we all know how important this is to all of us. And I uh, just really appreciate how you really uh, brought home um, the need for this research, right? Not only for your, the constituents, um, I'm thinking from a congressional mindset, so not only for your constituents of Florida, but you kind of tied it on to the entire Gulf Coast region, which is very helpful when you're advocating for um, uh, monies like this because you're bringing in several stakeholders outside of Florida, right? You're, you're hitting Texas, you're hitting Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, but you also said something that's kind of important to uh, my boss, which is uh, reaching out to some of our constituents, both in Florida and New York. We have a lot of um, Caribbean constituents, right, with families back in the Caribbean. So even tying that piece in is very helpful when you're advocating for uh, this, these type of uh, monies. So I just really want to commend you on kind of tying that together because it really uh, will help you in the long run in your strategy of trying to secure that uh, money. So great job. Thank you. Hi, Andres, once again. Uh, my name is Noemi. I don't know if I said that earlier. Um, so kind of just to piggyback on what you just said, being of Puerto Rican descent, it's very important to me to make the ties between Florida and Puerto Rico and how we can mutually benefit from research that's being done at FIU. Um, it's actually something we talked about in our last fly-in on climate resiliency. Um, but I was wondering what other ways you hope to engage maybe community stakeholders in the Caribbean, like maybe... <clears throat> 
the representative for Puerto Rico, or any other nonprofits and organizations that represent uh, the interests of the Caribbean people? Of course, that's an excellent question. I think that it is vital that FIU be able to not only post our research online for any individual to be able to see, but I think it's vital that we work closely with our partners both in the Caribbean as well as coastal states as this is research that can benefit everyone, every single constituent and all the way up to the federal government. Federal government hates to spend money and I think if we can reduce the FEMA costs that occur every single year, that's something that can help our constituents as they will be able to receive that money in community grants, project, project requests, earmark requests, appropriation requests that instead of saying, unfortunately, we spent $150 billion on the hurricane, we have no money to build this park, or we have no money that can contribute to your high school this year. Instead, by a lot, not only sharing our research, we'll be allowing the process to go a lot more streamlined by not letting any single person fall behind, by every single person being able to access what building materials are best suited for these high weather events, but to be able to truly reach every single community and allow every single community to have a better chance to withstand these. As you were mentioning, Puerto Rico, it's devastating. Year after year, we see how the island is left without power because of the hurricanes that occur. This is something that FIU wants to prevent and wants to fundamentally change the way we view hurricanes. We don't want to panic. We don't want anyone to be questioning whether or not they'll be able to survive this next hurricane. We want everyone to have the necessary tools to be better prepared, well suited, and to be making sure that, again, no one's left behind. Because at the end of the day, every single person in Congress, we know that we're here to serve our constituents. And if year after year our constituents are left behind with hurricanes, that's something that we have to fix. All right, thank you, Andreas. All right, who's our next Hamilton scholar? Up next is Nyla. All right, Nyla, let's go. Hello? Okay. We're going to go ahead and put that down just a little bit. Okay. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nyla Alcoser, um, and I'm going to give you a presentation on the project that I did for my time as a Hamilton Scholar this semester. So before I get into my project, um, here's a little bit about me. I'm majoring in sustainability and the environment and also pursuing a master's in environmental studies through a four plus one program. Um, and with that, I'm also minoring in political science. As a Hamilton scholar, my focus has been sustainability. If you haven't seen by my degree path, my interest is everything <laughs> sustainability um, and environment. So my interest is exploring the policy side of that while I'm here in DC. So with that, um, we can get into my project. So our clients here were our Institute of the Environment and the, di the director, Todd Crow, um, and that department covers anything that has to do with environment, uh, research, and education, um, and also our office, University of Sustainability on campus. So our hosting office was the White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy. Um, and they hosted this and were able to gather different federal agencies to come together to talk about sustainability at the university level. And that includes the National Science Foundation, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, the U United States Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Energy. So uh, if you haven't seen, um, my project was more an event rather than appropriations ask. So this event was the White House Forum on Campus and Community Scale Climate Change Solutions. And the aim here was to position universities as a hub for solutions when it comes to sustainable development. And that includes uh, fostering partnerships between universities at the national level. Um, there were about, or at least one representative um, of a university from each state. 
There's also uh, the aim to exchange ideas, provide support, and addressing any resources gaps um, to really just have universities helping each other out when it comes to sustainability. Um, where I come in, so I helped with the student voice, and when we're talking about universities, we can't neglect that student aspect um, when advancing climate solutions. So we had me as the FIU representative, um, and then we had a student from Rutgers, um, MAM University, MIT, and Fairmont State. And that student aspect, while we were able to attend the day one, which was the, you know, the White House Forum, um, where we were able to showcase what universities were doing and also engage government officials, um, students were really able to be hands-on when it came to the day two part, which was the workshops, where we had many discussions that revolved around our four major themes. And this was campus as living labs, climate action in the classroom, campus sustainability and resilience, and providing climate solutions to communities. So students here were able to act as moderators and also note takers to keep track of what university representatives were talking in each of these breakout rooms. Because um, under each theme, we had smaller topics. For example, um, I attended one where it was about under campus sustainability focused on EV. So I was able to learn about what other universities were doing to reduce carbon emissions on campus, as well as share what FIU has been doing um, on that same area when it comes to reducing carbon emissions. So the significance of having FIU involved in the scale of universities and creating this network of universities that are working towards sustainability. Um, obviously, FIU is a Hispanic serving institution, so having that, represented, that representation in this space is awesome. Um, and also, we're able to not only support our faculty, but also our students in making sure that we have that student voice involved in these discussions. Um, and also engaging with um, universities on the national level, because while each university is located different regionally, um, we're able to collaborate on things that have worked in other spaces that we can also apply into others. So while Perhaps Miami's main focus is, let's just say, sea level rise. Um, we can still assist with issues that are facing universities um, further inland. So now what's next? Um, we had this day, these two-day event. Um, we're able to showcase what university is doing, have discussions. Um, now we're able to collect and compile all the information that we got and actually make it into a report and move forward and actually make something of the event to help universities. Um, and also on my aspect when it comes to the student voice, making sure that students are engaged in talking about sustainability on campus, but also in their surrounding community. And for example, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but FIU has this sustainability network of different student organizations that are focused on sustainability. So strengthening that and also encouraging other universities to do the same would be great next steps to follow this great event on sustainability. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Oh yeah, I interned um, with the office of Congresswoman Kathy Castor, Tampa Bay area. Still Florida, Tampa Bay. Still Florida, Bay. yeah. All right, so can we get uh, here from one of our special guests who has something? Okay. Oh, Cyrus. Fantastic. Oh, Cyrus, you did a really fantastic job. Thank you. You did a fantastic job. Congratulations. I really liked how this wasn't necessarily an appropriations or a legislative request. This was more of a forum. This I've been seeing is very popular with the agriculture community, especially as farm bill starts to ramp up. The White House did a lot, so this is just very timely for what is actually happening on the Hill. Um, just curious, in one of your slides, I saw a couple of the universities that were listed, and I was just interested to know how you came about those. You know, I understand um, Florida and FIU, but there was Rutgers that's up in New Jersey and MIT that's in Boston. Is there some type of educational, and please inform me because I'm not aware, of the sustainability programs that those universities are engaging in? Yeah, so the aim in selecting universities was to have at least one representative from each state. 
Um, so once we were able to have that, we can have that comprehensive view of different environmental issues that they're facing and how they're dealing with it, and also changing the sizes of the universities and the resources that they have available. So not each university is at the same, maybe all Ivy Leagues or not. We can like bring more representation in that space in having one university from each state. Yeah. Awesome. Do we have a student we can hear from? Yes. First of all, I think your presentation was fabulous, but I was a little curious maybe if you could talk about um, what you think the benefit of forums like this with organizations such as the White House do not just for what you were trying to accomplish, but for FIU in the long run, like how it helps build FIU and how it helps the other projects that other Hamilton scholars and FIU is currently lobbying for. Yeah, so when it comes to having these big events like this where we're bringing different stakeholders involved, not only can we learn about what they're doing, we can also share what FIU has been doing. So we can gain and we can also give like resources to other universities to help along. For instance, my case would be sustainability, but if it's another issue like you guys were just discussing human trafficking, um, you're going to learn more about that in another presentation. But whatever issue it is, showing what FIU has done and what we can give to that space. Awesome. Thank you so much, Naira. All right, who's our next Hamilton scholar? Frank. <laughs> and Frank, tell tell us where you interned this semester. Uh -oh. Where did you intern, Frank? I wonder where. All right, so uh, some of the students already met me today, and I'll have a slide for that, actually. But... Uh, thank you, everybody, distinguished guests, Professor Stanberry, students, staff, uh, for joining us for this presentation today. My name is Frank Gamis. I'm a FIU Honors student and Hamilton Scholar. And uh, this semester, I interned here at FIU in D.C. with the Office of Governmental Relations. And you'll get to learn a little bit more about what I did while I was here this semester, studying political science uh, and national security studies. So for uh, my project of focus this semester, uh, my client was the Jack D. Gordon Institute for Public Policy at FIU. And within the Jack D. Gordon Institute, uh, they run the Security Research Hub. So Security Research Hub is a virtual open source uh, collection platform that focuses on collecting open source intelligence from Latin America and the Caribbean, essentially any issues that are going on in the Western Hemisphere, whether it's transnational crime, migration issues, um, regional health problems, illegal fishing, and other problems that are occurring in the Western Hemisphere, open source intelligence can be gathered without espionage, without military. It's just gathered from open sources. It comes, to, uh, it's collected, it comes together, and it's analyzed, essentially digested into usable uh, data. So the Security Research Hub has been around for a couple of years. And thanks to the advocacy efforts here at FIU in DC, in the last fiscal year 2023, FIU was able to um, secure uh, $4 million in programmatic and language requests for the Security Research Hub. And this was through the Department of Defense, as well as a community project funding request for 1.3 million, also Department of Defense. And this helps beef up the Security Research Hub so it can do the very important work that it does in, for our national security interests, but as well as for partners in the region who have that residual effect of protecting our hemisphere as a whole. But we don't stop uh, just with last year's request and successes, but this year we made some additional requests because the mission is not done and crime and issues around the world do not stop. So we had a, a two programmatic language requests, and what makes it different this time around is that in addition to requesting funds from Department of Defense, this time we're reaching into the State Department, and they do a lot of soft power and regional uh, assistance in the Western Hemisphere, and in this case, we're focused as well on Chinese influence in Latin America, the Caribbean as a whole. So in order to facilitate our uh, 
congressional funding request, as the crowd may have already mentioned before, some of our panelists and experts over here. Uh, in order to facilitate hosting events and panels are very, very important, right, these convenings. Just like my fellow did the White House convening, we're looking to make a convening of State Department officials and show them what the Sec Security Research Hub has been successful in doing with the uh, Department of Defense, but this time bringing in the State Department so they can also see a lot of the success. So that's what we're doing it. We're doing it because it's important to our national security interest and partners in the region. And it's gonna be here on May 16th. So the date, uh, save the date, May 16th. We hope that you can uh, see a little bit more about that. So our asks for this is to bring together the State Department and Security Research Hub so they can learn about each other, about this great tool that academia can do to help our national security interests with the goal of advancing uh, security in our region. So why is this important? Uh, every day, more and more people get connected to the internet. Uh, right here, we have some statistics that you'll see that over 4 billion people are connected to the internet daily. And in our region, in the Western Hemisphere, it's approaching over 800 million people, which is 80% connectivity of people in the Western Hemisphere. As more people use the internet, there's more data, more raw data, and it becomes more difficult for just the military to be able to look through this data and make actionable intelligence from it. So by having partners in academia and other sectors, we can help, uh, we can help secure our region, and the Security Research Hub does precisely that. You'll see here that there's a dollar amount estimate to the value of this data, and it's expected to grow by over 24% uh, to over $25 million. The Security Research Hub has five main objectives, which is to facilitate information sharing, to foster analytic exchange, to create a shared understanding of security challenges, to enhance analytic capabilities, and to cultivate future, future national security workforces. Key players uh, for this project are, of course, the Security Research Hub that started at the Gordon Institute at FIU and the State Department that we want to bring together. I identified the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs as the most relevant to bring over to this convening. And, of course, uh, congressional offices. So, as many know, uh, members of Congress are, cannot be an expert in every single area. So, the staff that are in their offices have specialties, and we want to bring uh, members of congressional staff of members' offices that specialize in national security or Western Hemisphere affairs to this convening so they can learn a little bit more about the Security Research Hub. And, of course, the main player here is the intelligence community as a whole. Thank you very much, and I'll take some questions. Okay, you can hear me. Um, as someone who works for someone who prides himself in public safety, I thought that was a great job. Um, I think that, you know, when you talk about security, um, trust, data, and all that, that's a new frontier. That's going to be the next battle. We need to be very um, cautious of what we put out. And I think that what you highlighted, your successes in FY23 and what your challenges are in FY24 is a great kind of roadmap of where you want to go. Um, I think that what I, what you can think about doing is maybe making it a little bit more, more broad, too, as well. Um, maybe talk about not just congressional offices, but also committees like a homeland. Um, you know, I would just broaden the scope a little bit and also think about maybe DHS could be a player in this as well, another agency, because you want to get everyone um, bought in. I think security is, is so broad that it has an interest in a lot of players. But... Ultimately, I thought that the data that you put in there, all the words, the info was awesome and great. Thank you very much. Sound like you got a person to invite for May 16th. He's upstairs. Yeah. All right. Any student? We need a student. Input. Speechless. Oh, go ahead. Um, hello, um, everyone. So I am very 
thankful and so impressed by the presentations. I am an international student from Tanzania. And based on your presentation, I'm just curious about one thing. When you speak about security challenges, does that also imply um, in cybersecurity issues? Mm -hmm. So it definitely goes uh, in cybersecurity issues. And as you saw, the Security Research Hub has also gone into new territory. So illegal phishing, migration patterns, refugee crises. And in the past, when the Security Research Hub has been working with the Department of Defense, it has been a very global, you know, as it first started. And for this fiscal year, as we try to bring in the State Department, we're doing a regional approach in the Western Hemisphere. But definitely, if the whole world is more secure, our nation is more secure. Thank you so much. And just um, one more last question. Um, this is just out of curiosity. I know you mentioned something about understanding security challenges as one of the objectives. Could you mention at least one of those things in particular? Of course. So to, um, to bring into light one of the very interesting things I saw from the learned from the Security Research Hub that is one of our regional security challenges that is not directly uh, impacting the United States was the last big hurricane that made landfall in Haiti and made destruction. So the Security Research Hub is, was able to collect the data of that storm surge and how much destruction it did and pair it up with maps and keep that data together. And it was able to see how that impacted not only the aid that was being, uh, that was coming into Haiti, but uh, crime patterns after the hurricane made landfall. For more information, though, I do invite you to go to srh.fiu.edu, Security Research Hub, srh.fiu.edu, and I'll take more questions after everyone's done presenting. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. All right, who is our next Hamilton scholar? Alexa. Alexa. She's making her grand entrance. Alexa also comes armed with a prop. Okay. I'll let her surprise you. All right, Alexa. Show me how to enable it. Here we go. Well, I have something to share and read. To put the slides to do. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I'm going to be a little. Is that a good way? Mm -hmm. Walk in. Okay. Hi. Okay. Hi, so this is my honor seminar project. A little bit about me. So the picture that you can see over there is a city where I'm from. I'm from Lima, Peru, and I came here when I was around 12. I'm currently studying at FIU. I'm doing a double bachelor's in international relations and Prague, which is public relations, advertising, and communications. Right now, I'm doing a congressional internship at Capitol Hill with Representative Darren Soto, and it's honestly been such a great learning experience. Um, I'm a press intern. So I got to do everything related to tweets, social media, which is really great for me since it's one of my majors, and it's really what I want to focus on in the future. Actually, I also want to go to law school after graduation and do human rights laws and focus on anything related to human trafficking and human rights. Yes, so my client is the Global Forensic and Justice Center of FIU. Um, it's ranked one of the best in online masters in forensic science, and it's a living institution about it. The leading person in my project is Professor Patrick Roman, and it's actually about this device that I will talk about it in another slide. Oh my gosh. Sorry, guys, I'm terrible at this. Okay, so this is the. How do I do that type of video? This is just a little video um, that's going to explain what the center is really about. Intensive forensic science program is rooted in Justice Center is a collaboration born from decades of research, training, and innovation. Built on the foundation of one of Florida's oldest undergraduate forensic science programs, GFJC connects the crime scene to the courtroom. Our commitment to being the world's most comprehensive forensic science program is rooted in cross-cutting innovation, pushing forensic science beyond the traditional laboratory. 
GFJC coordinates forensic sciences and criminal justice efforts across Florida International University. Our structure builds on four established focus areas, academia, industry, technology, and international justice, dramatically expanding the university's footprint and providing unparalleled opportunities for students, postdocs, faculty, practitioners, and agencies worldwide. We aim to make today's innovation tomorrow's standard as we build a more globally just society. So this is what my project is really about. I have a prop here that you guys can see. I'm going to pass it around. You guys can actually touch it. So it's called the Portable Forensics Chemical Analyzer. This device will obtain any type of information that is at a crime scene. So when you go to a crime scene, there can be drug residue, um, gunpowder residue, any type of residue that usually would take like days or weeks to process in a lab. This device, as you can see, can obtain all that information and store it and give the answers in minutes that will really expedite the process when re regarding to any type of crime. Um, the Department of Homeland Security can really use this as border drug control since in the border, you know, drugs can be as much and that can tell you what type of drug it is. The Department of Defense can also use it in military bases um, to test different bomb and gunpowder residues and really have it in minutes instead of sending it to a lab that takes days, two weeks. So the ask, um, we're asking Congress to upper pay money to the FIU Forensic Center for this. Basically, the device that we have right now is 40 pounds. We want to make it into a 20 pound one that you can transport it anywhere. As you can see, anybody can really carry it. It's not that heavy. And this can really help the, every single type of department in different types of different fields. Um, we're also asking the Department of Homeland Security to purchase the device for the border or any other types that they might need it domestically. Um, some of the key players are, like I mentioned, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, and we also have some members of Congress that we're working with for this appropriations bill. Is U.S. Congressman Mario diaz Balar, um, Maria Elvira Salazar, and Debbie Washington Schultz, that is actually my representative. So what is human trafficking? I know that most of us have a concept about human trafficking, but what really is human trafficking? As you can see on the right picture, um, there's not only women, there is men as well. Human trafficking knows no gender, no religion, no color, no race, and especially no borders. Human trafficking can really happen to anybody. It's, human trafficking is basically when somebody is forced into sexual labor or hard physical labor. Um, in that picture over there, you can see a woman being rescued by the police as a human trafficking victim. So when this device comes into play, is when these people are rescued, the crime scene needs to be processed. Like there needs to be, you know, testing for drugs, testing for the gunpowder residue or any type of thing. This device can really help on any other type of technological advancement because it can expedite the process because usually when it's sent to a lab, it takes weeks to days. And by the time it's processed, the responsible for it, the human trafficking gang or ring has already escaped. So this type of device is like the one you guys are passing around holding um, can really expedite the process and help these victims find justice. So solutions through this project. Um, as you can see, Florida is part of the three states with the highest um, human trafficking records, and that was in 2021. And I'm pretty sure that by 2023 it has not gone down, sadly, because human trafficking is a recurring issue. that not happened just in Florida. It can happen in anywhere in the world. And it's honestly really sad. Um, solutions for this project can be this type of technological advancements like the one you're holding and any other type. That's why we're asking the funding for this project to be turned from a 40 pound to a 20 pound device that can be transported easily. To end the presentation on a good note, um, this is Belle Barbu. She was abducted when she was a newborn in a baby yard in a hospital 25 years ago. And she was reunited in America with her family after a long time, as you can see, the really happy pictures. This is a happy story because it ended in a happy ending, but it's really sad because she was abducted and the people who actually adopted her believed that she was given up for adoption voluntarily. The parents were told that she was murdered, that she was just like, she died in the hospital yard. So when they found out that she was alive and she found out through Ancestry, the website, 
that her real family was alive and it was not in Wisconsin, America. She traveled to Romania and was able to reunite with her family. Um, human trafficking affects all of us. Like I said, there's no borders, no race. It doesn't matter if you're a boy or a man or children. It can happen to anybody. So this is a recurrent issue that we have to tackle and devices like this can really help with that. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. All right. Hi. Uh, great presentation, first of all. I think it's very important to bring from that investigation piece to the prosecution piece. As you know, human trafficking doesn't really get a lot of prosecutions. It's a very hard crime to prosecute. So I think this could really assist in that. On a personal note, I'm also Peruvian, so great similarity there. Um, but yeah, so you know, human trafficking could happen in a variety of different settings. So in a setting as a person getting trafficked by their own family, uh, what kind of information can that machine, uh, the device, get from kind of domestic terrorism, um, domestic trafficking cases that might not have like gunpowder, might not have um, sort of other things to identify a victim by? Like, you know, familial trafficking could be a problem, but it's definitely something that's happening. So how could it, this device really support cases something as like familial trafficking. And also, has there been a uh, survivor inclusion in these conversations when um, trying to secure this funding? Um, has there been survivor inclusion in the whole device process? Um, regarding the survivor inclusion, I'm pretty sure there has been examples of different types of victims that have been survived this horrible human trafficking rings and everything they've been put through. Um, regarding the family ones, you can use this device like in a crime scene. So this device is usually like you can take any type of like stuff that's happened in the crime scene that you would take to a lab. So this does not replace a lab because obviously a lab gives you it's more like an in you know. But this device can help expedite like the simple stuff like really fast again like, within minutes that so you don't have to wait days or you don't have to wait weeks for it to get in a lab or the answer about it. So would it be able to pick up different traces of say for example like different semen like from different individuals like on the spot? Yeah, the different type of specimens that I didn't want to say, but yes. <laughs> Human trafficking is a dark crime. Yeah, you know, so. it's very dark. That's why I wanted to end it with Barbu over here, because she seems really happy. And it's just a really sad story, you know, like it's not just her. This was 25 years ago. She does not know her family, and it can happen to anybody. Even us, when we have kids, you know, you never know. So thank you for being the voice for these survivors. Mm -hmm. Do we have a Student. Student comment. Hi, I'm Diana. Um, I just want to say um, thank you for your presentation, Alexa, because that's something I'm, um, that's relating to what I want to do with my career. Um, my question was kind of similar to his, but um, to differentiate between that, I just want to say, even though you said that this wouldn't um, outdate the lab, but later on in the years, do you think it would? And like how efficient would it be um, compared to lab data, even though like your ask is to turn it from a 40 pound to a 20 pound to be more transportable? Um, so basically my question is like, would you ever consider like this will be more um, efficient compared to a lab? Um, later on down the years. Definitely. Um, it was originally heavier than 40 pounds. I cannot remember right now the exact, num the exact number. But it has been over the years coming down, you know, a smaller way so we can, anybody can transport it. I'm pretty sure during the years, the more funding there is supplied, the more research there is supplied, we're going to make it even smaller and more efficient, more rapid, that can, like, get any type of specimen that will be sent to a lab faster as well. Okay, then. Thank you. All right, so can everyone hear me? Yeah? Does the microphone work? That's the real question. Hello, hello. Hello. 
Yellow. Okay, no problem. All right. But this is wireless, so even better. There you go. All right. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Boeck. Uh, I am one of the Hamilton Scholars for uh, the spring of 2023. Uh, thank you all so much for being out here today. I mean, just having a packed room like this full of people that are all just very passionate about government relations and health and just all different types of aspects of life that we all need that are necessary. I, thank you for being here, truly. <laughs> so, as we see here, uh, my project, I've focused it on environmental justice in Miami. Um, back when I was actually living in Miami, hold on, I had the same problem last time. There we go. So, um, that's me over there on the left. Uh, that's a huge photo, but cool. Uh, yeah, so I am a senior pursuing a Bachelor's of Arts in International Relations with an undergraduate certificate in National Security Studies from the Jack D. Gordon Institute. So shout out Frank, uh, that's an amazing institute to be a part of. Uh, additionally to that, um, some of my interests have always been diversity, equity, and inclusion, always doing advocacy and uh, policy reform. Um, I've always been uh, very active on campus, so some of the things that I used to do uh, when I was on campus was I was a student ambassador with the Office of Social Justice and Inclusion. Also another student ambassador with the Alumni Association, which I see some uh, student ambassadors from FIU here, so you, you, you know who you are, you know. Whoop, whoop. So with that being said, also, oh, and just like a little more of a, instead of interest, I also put a little hobby. Uh, I love exploring new areas, so me being in Washington, D.C., I've been soaking every single experience that I've been able to, so that has been amazing. And if anyone is interested in becoming a Hamilton Scholar, you're always more than welcome to ask me how my experiences have been. Uh, if any of you are interested in what I've been doing, I mean, I'm going to talk about it right now, but if you want more in-depth, you're more than welcome to approach. So... Nope, too much. There we go. So, before looking at this, when you think of Miami, what do you, what's the first thing that pops in your head? Restaurants. All right. There we go. All right. I'm, I'm going to just pick one person. Uh, you. Me? Yeah. Oh, I just think lively and beaches. Perfect. All right. Mainly beaches, right? A lot of water, right? Cool. Perfect. All right. So, like I said, I mean, we all know some of these sites. For instance, we have uh, the historic Miami Beach. We also have here the Brickell City Center. We have the skyline, always beautiful. We have some of the uh, mangrove trees that are in Coral Gables, uh, Coral Gables itself. However, have you ever seen what happens once it starts raining for longer than, I don't know, like 15, 20 minutes? Ah, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, boom, that's where this comes in. Always like that. I mean, these are all photos that have been very recent. I've, I know for a fact I've experienced this more than once or twice. So, you know, especially like something like this. I was always living in the suburbs, so this was a constant thing for me. I think this photo is from Doral. So if anyone's from Doral, you probably realize which, uh, you know, maybe what community that is. So either way, this has always been a problem. And basically all that I've always wanted to try and do is see how we could go ahead and fix this. With that being said, I basically kind of made a weird approach to this because I wanted to do a project that was a little different. So I thought not how is it that we could change this exactly with, you know, sewers and stuff, but I was more interested in seeing how it is that we could go ahead and maybe fix like the sewer systems and the septic systems. And, you know, because once you flush the toilet, where does all that go? So that's where this came in. So uh, usually uh, Florida, as we all know, that is a land mass that is currently sinking all the time. Uh, that's why if you look here at this demographic, all the sea level rise that's coming here, that's pushing all this land down. With, uh, when all this water starts coming up, most of the uh, houses that are in South Florida, they all use septic tanks mainly. And usually once the water level starts rising and these starts becoming more and more un undated, that's when more contamination starts happening to the drinking water of South Florida and that's just gonna lead to, lead to very catastrophic problems. So we don't want that. So with this being said, this is how the septic system usually works. You have the septic tanks, they go here, they go into the drain fields, and then usually they kind of go into the soil as for, uh, fertilizer. However, with sea level rise, when, wa when groundwater starts coming up, that's when we have problems here and this starts rising. We don't want that, obviously. So. How do we fix this? We have to start converting some of the houses in South Florida. Instead of making them go from septic, we need to take them to sewer. This would be more of a public, uh, a public city uh, project. 
With that being said, how we could do this is instead of them all going to a septic sewer that's personalized, they all would go into the main sewer system. Some of the houses in South Florida, they already have this going on. However, that's a very expensive project to do. So with that being said, it seems okay. Places like Coral Gables, Doral, some of the cities there that are a little more well off, they have the expenditures to kind of get this done. However, there are other communities that they're having a lot more trouble doing this. So how is it that we're going to be able to basically fix this problem? Well, first things first, let me show you some of the key players that I would like to propose in order to try to tackle this problem. So um, has anyone been to the Biscayne Bay campus? Is anyone familiar with the Biscayne Bay campus? All right, perfect, perfect. Well, yeah, um, the surrounding areas where the Biscayne Bay campus are, uh, those are the areas that I really would want to focus on in order to try to fix this whole problem and trying to convert as many houses as possible to sewer instead of septic, just because uh, some of these uh, communities have been underserved and they probably don't have the expenditures in order to really get the job done. So keep that in mind. So one of the main people that I would like to bring about would be the Institute of Environment from FIU. Uh, here, this is where uh, they have their amazing director, Todd Crawl. He's been visiting us a bunch of times. Shout out Todd, wherever he is. Whoever's recording, I want you to send them that. Cool. <laughs> so, like I said, uh, Todd Crawl, he's an amazing human. He has so much research under his belt about environmental catastrophes and stuff like that. With that being said as well, um, he's also, like him and the Institute of Environment, they're responsible for numerous research projects across South Florida. For instance, uh, they're involved with the Wall of Wind, and Dress already talked about that. Shout out Andres to him. Uh, we also have here some saltwater intrusion buoys that they've been going about in the Biscayne Bay. Uh, those have been actively monitoring if there has been any saltwater intrusion in the fresh uh, water that we have in some of the bays. Uh, additionally to that, once we go here, Another key component that I want to add to this um, group would be Resilient 305. Resilient 305, they're actually a collaboration among Miami-Dade County municipalities. Uh, the really cool thing about them is that they all have different chief resiliency officers, that they all have different meetings together. This is where they all advocate to each other about what's wrong with their communities, uh, what environmental hazards they're facing the most. So considering that FIU already has all this research going on, why don't we do a collaboration since we have the voices of the people right then and there? So one of the main things that I also want to bring about would be the Office of Social Justice and Inclusion. Considering that this is a social justice issue, um, this is uh, David Bynes. He is one of the directors of OSJI. That would be Graham Center 216 if you want to stop by and say hello. He's an amazing person. I, I have been with him for so long sometimes in meetings because of my previous ambassador role and amazing guy nonetheless. Um, we've gotten into a few arguments about certain things, but amazing guy. <laughs> um, nonetheless, uh, basically uh, what they do, they do facilitate panels and programs throughout the university campuses. They've also done a lot of research regarding certain, um, certain communities already that are underserved and are minorities or minority uh, serving. Um, so. Now that we have the three key players that I would like to get involved with or like to create a collaboration, this is where we then go to the Environmental Protection Agency. We've all heard of them, the EPA. They're the ones that go ahead and they protect people in the environment from significant health risks. They're the ones that also help create and enforce laws uh, that, in the end of the day, protect the environment. Um, also, they're the ones that actually give a lot of federal funding to start uh, these projects in order to help uh, save the environment. Um, one thing that's really cool about that is that recently they've been given uh, $3 billion from the Inflation Reduction Act that just passed last year. Uh, the really cool thing about that is um, $50 billion uh, can actually been, uh, be given out to different partners and collaborations over a one to three year period. So the reason why that is very important to understand is because the EPA just recently started releasing a request for environmental and climate justice block programs. Uh, this is actually really cool because one of the block grants that they gave out is called the Thriving Community Subgrants. Um, this is actually very interesting because what they're prioritizing is actually partnerships with minority serving uh, communities and institutions. And if you didn't notice, FIU is a minority serving institution. MSI, yes. So, um, 
basically what uh, we're trying to do is that we're trying to go ahead and get this um, one of these block grants. We're going to go ahead and start uh, submitting some requests for it. Um, like we said, up to $50 million a pop can go for each of these programs if it's done uh, within like a one to three year period. So that's something that we could definitely uh, benefit from and also we could definitely help some of the communities in South Florida as well. So another thing here. So why FIU and Resilient 305? I kind of went over that. As I said, FIU, we already offer a lot of research that could really help with improving infrastructure, uh, also going to places where infrastructure is lacking and trying to see where it is that we could help most. Um, considering that we also have the Resilient 305 acting as an umbrella, uh, considering that we have all these people from all the different um, sub-communities and municipalities, they could also say uh, they could tell us what it is that's wrong with their communities or what they would like to be improved. So getting all the voices in one place and then having the research for it, that's a win-win. So on top of that, why is it that this aligns with my passions and my interests and all that amazing stuff is because, okay, I've always felt that I've been a very community service-oriented individual. Um, considering the student ambassador roles that I've done, um, I've also, oh, I didn't even tell you guys what I was doing as an internship here, did I? Yeah, nice. <laughs> So I'm actually uh, interning with the Europe and Eurasia Bureau with the United States Agency for International Development. Um, it's been a little busy. Uh, they're the ones that deal with uh, Ukraine and uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, that whole region, the southern Caucasus of Russia as well. Um, it's been a very interesting experience. It's been very uh, busy. It's been very thought provoking to see how, you know, even though you don't see the labor of your work, in front of you, you still get to feel that sense of, that, uh, of completion, that you're actually doing something not only for yourself, but you're part of something that's even bigger than yourself. Um, if anyone wants any more information on how to get involved with federal agency work and anything like that, I'm always more than happy to point you in the right direction or just talk to you about how my experiences have been, things like that. Um, also, uh, in FIU in DC, we're also like a big family, so if anyone just wants to reach out to anyone or get connected with anyone, you're more than, all you have to do is just ask and you most likely shall receive, so. <laughs> so on top of that, I will go ahead and say thank you so much for listening and this would be the end of my project. Thank you. And now I will go ahead and take some questions. Sewer, the sewer system, so we just learned a little <laughs> bit about how that was structured, so thank you for that tutorial. Um, I'm very curious on um, some of the partners that you're bringing to the table to kind of work with. Um, you say you're very, uh, you're very interested in DEI work, I, I, as well as I. Um, my background is in, uh, in reproductive justice, but also knowing, similar to environmental justice, we have a lot of organizations and groups who are on the ground in our communities doing great work. Um, however, they are doing a lot of DEI work, but a lot of times, sometimes, uh, the leads of those organizations are not necessarily representative of our communities or from our communities, right? So I want to know, have you thought about any local partners that you can work with whose leadership um, uh, are from the communities and look like the communities you're trying to serve to bring them to the table, to give them a seat at the table so we can have uh, um, an adequate solution to uh, some of these problems? Yeah, of course. And exactly what you said, that uh, history has shown that there have been certain problems already pertaining to that. Um, like I said, the good thing about Resilient 305 is that all the municipalities, they all, they all nominate their own representatives to kind of go to that table. And that's what they call the resiliency officers. So all of them, no one has like a higher voice than the other. They're all co uh, collaboratively meeting up and they're all collaboratively talking about what it is that's wrong with their communities or what is it that needs to be improved and the urgency of it. From there, that's when they all take a vote, and then that's when they go ahead and see what it is that needs to get done. Um, on top of that, the reason why um, I also wanted to get other, um, other offices involved, for instance, the OSJI office, was because I felt as if, yes, um, the good thing about FIU is that we have two main campuses, which is the Biscayne Bay campus and also the MMC campus. I feel as if having both um, the representatives from both of these offices, because they have two offices in you know, one in MMC and one in BBC, to have all that as a collaborative effort and also just to have the umbrella effect from Resilient 305. 
So that would hopefully that answered. Awesome. Do we have a student? Um, so thank you for your presentation. I think this one was something that um, I found most interesting to me, specifically how you incorporated different both on campus and off campus organizations and how they could partner together. One of the things that kind of came up for me was the sustainability of what you're trying to implement. And I feel like there's a lot of room for to develop a partnership that remains sustainable, even in the wake of HB99 um, and what that effect might have on the OSJI office and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So what do you think or what is your opinion on creating a sustainable program around issues like this to promote the conservation of these departments, but then also the community partnerships that FIU so proudly um, likes to likes to promote? Yeah. Um, and when you mean uh, conserving of departments, uh, are you talking about the municipalities or Resilient 305 or? Mainly like OSJI. I know yeah. you wanted to bring in David Bynes, which I think is a really great idea um, just to promote some sort of program that could be developed within OSJI so that we can find sustainable solutions and still bring the community on board. Yeah. No, and exactly. That's why I would definitely want their voices to be in this whole collaboration that we're trying to build. Just because, um, for instance, you need people from all walks of life. The more diversity, I feel that's when everyone truly shines. That's when everyone's voices truly get out to the table. And that's when everything really just flows perfectly. Because when certain voices aren't at the table, how do you know that there's even a voice? Or how do you know that there is representation happening at all because if you don't have all voices it's impossible for them to be heard it's impossible for action to be taken and then it just leads to you know a negative chain effect basically so uh, definitely having them involved um, also the fact that resilient 305 does have this um, umbrella effect of not only let's say uh, resiliency officers of just uh, Doral and Aventura it has resiliency officers from all the municipalities so this would be, um, for instance, Weston, Little Haiti, uh, Kendall, all of them, all the municipalities. So that's how I feel as if all the voices could be presented. And then with Todd Crawl and the Institute of Environment, that's where we get the research part. So hopefully that answered your question. Appreciate it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank so, you, Emmanuel. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, Gabo, let's go. So before we start, I would like to ask you, how many hours have you been here listening to presentations and information, like an average? A lot, right? And this is the last presentation. So I'm going to ask you to stand up real quick and just stretch, let the, the, the blood flow in, breathe. And the good news is that we have food, guys. So... Be ready. <laughs> nice stretch. Perfect. We're ready to start. You can sit down. <laughs> All right. So raise your hand if you know what is this beautiful city, if you know the name. Okay. What's the city? Miami. The city of Miami. We know the city. But I came to this country, to this city, the city of Miami, five years ago. And I realized that there are common issues. Um, when you think about Miami, what is one issue that you think? Traffic. What? <laughs> that was the first issue. <laughs> great job, great job. What is the second issue when you think about Miami? Oh, you're almost there, sea level, sea level rising. And the third one, I'm going to give you a hint. This issue can breathe. People. Well, <laughs> the last issue that we have is alligators. Yes, but we are going to talk about today about sea level rising. So, 
My name is Gabriel Rondon, and my project is the saltwater intrusion. To start off, I'm going to say a little bit about my background. I'm not a typical intern that comes here with a political background to Washington, D.C. I'm, com I'm coming from a, an engineering background. I'm studying construction management, engineering at FIU, and also a Hamilton scholar. But my reason, the reason that I'm doing this project is because I love my city. I love the city of Miami. And I know that this city has a silent killer. And I like to call it silent killer because we don't notice it, but it's happening every single year. And it's that the sea level is rising. So what is the current situation? To understand more this topic, um, we need to understand that we have a main source of drinkable water, which is the Biscayne Aquifer. And what's happening is that in, in this aquifer, there is salt water intrusion. And for those who don't know, saltwater intrusion is basically salt water coming into fresh water, make it undrinkable. And what is the issue with that? The issue with that is that one contact with salt water can take years to flush out. So the first concern is that as the city of Miami is growing every single month, every single year. So that means that more people are, are needing water. So the demand is increasing. And on top of that, we have the sea level that is rising. So I'm going to show you here a video of how this works. We have the Atlantic Ocean, salt water. We have the Biscayne Aquifer, fresh water. And the beautiful city of Miami, we have the wells. And we consume water, and sometimes we overpump. We overuse this water. So essentially, what we're creating here is some cones of depression or open spaces for the salt water to intrude in the city, to enter into our wells and contaminate it, make it undrinkable. So what we need to do is take care of the, the, of the Biscayne water, let it recharge, and it will naturally push the groundwater. But the problem is that the sea level rising is creating more and more and more pressure, making it go to this way and affecting our wells. So that's the current issue that we have. In simple words, in a simple video, that is what's happening in Miami right now. So I'm going to show you some, some data that you can see how the situation is getting worse exponentially. So in the 19, from 1923 to 2009, we see an increment of 1 12th of an inch per year. But if you can see here in the last part, we see an exponential growth, a huge growth, and it's half an inch per year. And some people we're saying that, yeah, Miami can be flooded by 2,100. This was a picture of you know, Miami in 100 years. But actually, some research, some recent studies have shown that this can happen as early as 2060, in a couple of decades. So we need to pay attention, and we need to take action. So what are the consequences of saltwater intrusion? Well, first, we have a shortage in drinking water meaning that more people are going to need water and there's not going to be water available with the economic impact because we have you know, tourism, we have industries that rely on, on fresh water. The environmental impact, there are going to be some plants or animals who are going to be killed um, by the salt water and a decline in agriculture production. So what is our ultimate goal? Our ultimate goal is just to protect the city of Miami to protect our residents, our business, our agriculture, to protect the fresh water that supplies for all of these activities. So we have the solution. And the solution I abbreviated CSMSS. And it stands for Coastal Surface Monitoring System Station. And I'm just going to explain it as simple as possible. So we're going to have these weather stations located in key points in the city to start gathering the data. And that's going to be using the tensiometer. And this tensiometer is just going to measure the amounts of, of moisture in the, uh, in the soil, the chemicals, and different pressures. And that's going to give us the data in, in a data logger, in a cloud. And ultimately, what we want is to have graphs. These graphs will show us how many how many wells are impacted or the quantity in terms of salt or fresh water. Because in this case, information is key. And the faster we have that information, the faster we can take actions. So we will improve in early detection when we see something that is not 
common. If we see an area that has more salt than usual, we can attack it really fast. We are going to have the data collection, uh, water management to, to measure how much um, pumping of the water can we use, public education, and the response time. In this project, we are looking for federal funding for research and gather the data and inform the law lawmakers and take action. And I need to make an emphasis that this is not a new project. This is a project that has been in the Senate and, they, and it actually passed um, and they gave us $9 million to start this project and, and produce the, 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 the project itself. And our key players, we have the U.S. Department of Interior, the Miami-Dade Water County, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the Southwest Florida Water Management District. And we have also members of the Congress who can say, who's this person right here? And the other person? Yes. And lastly, my client. My client is Florida International University, our beautiful university, which is um, growing every year in terms of research, in programs, um, the community engagement, and the innovations. So thank you so much for your attention. For your attention, let's take care of our beautiful city of Miami, and thank you so much. Thank you, Gabo. Okay. As someone that isn't in the political world, as most of you are here, how do you think you can engage the FIU community to take part of this um, project? That's a good question because, again, as not having this political background at the beginning, it was, um, it was a challenge. But at the end of the day, it's about involvement. How can you engage in the community and actually inform them? As I said, knowledge is, is key. So if we're having the, the engagement, the knowledge, and the information to put it out there in, in some social events or, or informative events, we can gather the community and teach them about this current issue. So I think, in summary, it's just engagement uh, and the combination of giving the knowledge to the people. Thank you. All right, do we have a student that would like to add something? I know we do. Last question of the night before the food. So thank you for your presentation. So I'm from St. Lucie County, Florida, which kind of has a similar issue, except the issue is more so the brackish water and red tide. So how do you think your innovations, like the things that you're asking for in your presentation, will impact other counties? And how will that be translated to other coastal counties as well? Yes, that's a good question because once we know that something's working in one county, we can transfer it to the other counties. And essentially what we're working here is the information, the, the, the data that we are not having because this is a problem that we don't see. It's, under, it's underground, it's in the soil. So once we gather the information and see that it's, it's working in, in District 25, for example, we can transfer it. And again, as I said in the presentation, it, it gives us quicker response time. It gives us more information to educate the lawmakers and, and keep progress in, on this issue. Of course. 